thank you very much. I appreciate uh, a relatively brief introduction. The most important thing you need to know is I've been a federal prosecutor for about 28 years. They swore me in on December 3rd of 1990, and they never swear you out, uh, as you all know. And I have some prepared remarks uh, for you, but first I just want to personally welcome you to the Department of Justice. For those of you who are here for the first time, uh, it's a remarkable building. This building was built in the 1930s. Uh, if you have an opportunity to wander around, and they gave you all red badges, so you probably can't wander freely around the building, but on your way in and out, uh, I hope you have a chance just to observe and absorb uh, the history of this building. It really is a remarkable place to work. I always enjoy, as I walk the halls, thinking about uh, all the people who have worked here in the past, former attorneys general, former career folks, and I've had the opportunity to know so many of them over the years uh, and to absorb the lessons and apply the principles that motivate us here in the department. I know many of you are state and local law enforcement officials, prosecutors. Uh, we also have some assistant U.S. attorneys and DOJ prosecutors as well. Uh, and I hope you find this to be a worthwhile opportunity to network, to get to know folks from around the country. I spoke with the uh, leadership of both your organizations, NDAA and NAG, this morning. Uh, about the value of just getting people together from various places around the country to coordinate about our joint mission, to commiserate about some of the common challenges that we face, uh, and to find a way forward to keep our communities safer. Uh, I am very proud that the department is able to co-sponsor this symposium with uh, the National Association of AGs and the National uh, DA's Association. It's been really a critical um, uh, collaboration for us here in the department. Ted Hunt, who many of you know, uh, former local prosecutor from Missouri, has been working with us for about a year, uh, and his primary mission is to coordinate with all of you to make sure the department's doing everything that we can to support your work. Last year, you're probably aware of the surge we experienced in many places in the country in violent crime and of drug overdose deaths, and our department responded to that by making it a priority to coordinate with state and local law enforcement. The president considers it imperative for our federal agents and prosecutors to support our state and local partners and to help reduce crime. And the Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, consistently emphasizes that most law enforcement is state and local. I think about 85% of law enforcement officers are actually state and local law enforcement officers. So we cannot reduce crime unless we uh, cooperate and collaborate together. I got to work very closely with state and local prosecutors during my time as U.S. Attorney in Maryland. And the most remarkable thing for me was to realize uh, how much we have in common. There are very few partisan differences uh, among prosecutors. Law enforcement uh, tends to be a relatively nonpartisan endeavor, and we are all joined together in the mission of finding ways to more effectively combat crime and to make our communities safer. The prosecutors are not just lawyers who happen to work for the government. From the perspective of many of our citizens, we are the government. And when they think about the government, whether federal, state, or local, they think about the people that they deal with and the interactions that they have, most often uh, for both witnesses, or I should say witnesses, victims, as well as defendants, uh, some of their most emotional uh, experiences are when they have to deal with law enforcement. So people's interactions with us create indelible memories and really form their impression of their government and forever influence the way that they view law enforcement. That's one of the things I think that's critical about our efforts to uh, uh, ensure good policing is for the police officers to recognize that uh, there are times, obviously, when they're dealing with criminals and they need to be tough, but they also need to be cognizant of the fact that most members of the community are looking to them as representatives of the government, and we need, whenever we can, to form uh, uh, good relationships uh, to create positive impressions of law enforcement. One of the inscriptions on the outside of this main justice building and you can always look at the outside of the building, even if they don't let you wander the inside. But if you look up on the building, both inside and outside, there are inscriptions throughout the building. And one of the inscriptions on the outside of the building reads, justice in the life and conduct of the state is possible only as it first resides in the hearts and souls of the citizens. The keeping justice in the hearts and souls of the citizens is part of our job. That gives us a special responsibility to build public confidence in law enforcement by acting with integrity and professionalism and candor. Our offices, whether it be federal, state, or local, all exercise significant power, and we must always use that power wisely. It's our duty to enforce the law and to follow the facts wherever they may lead, and we need to ensure that our decisions are never influenced by political considerations. I've served under nine attorneys general, and on every floor of this building, there are reminders for me of the heroes, mentors, and friends 
who are, have worked here, and I hope each of you gain similar inspiration from the history of your offices. In 1985, Attorney General Ed Meese spoke to a group of district attorneys and observed that the prosecutor occupies a unique position in the criminal justice system. At the most direct level, his decision-making ability, the critical prosecution decisions, whether or not to charge a case and what to charge in a particular case, and his advocacy skill determine the real quality of justice in your communities. In 1940, Attorney General Robert Jackson delivered a speech in this building to a federal state conference on law enforcement problems. The goal was to facilitate cooperation between federal agents and their state and local counterparts. Jackson said that the public looks to the state and federal governments to work together in cooperation. He emphasized that law enforcement officers at all levels share a grave responsibility, and he expressed his hope that this meeting will result in the establishment of some machinery for the interchange of ideas and general coordination of efforts in the future. I hope that that same exchange of ideas and coordination of efforts takes place this week because forensic science is a critically important tool for law enforcement. Dr. Edmond Locard, a French criminologist and forefather of modern forensic science, famously remarked, every contact leaves a trace. We refer to that principle as Locard's exchange principle. The thesis is that any physical interaction with a given environment both takes from and leaves behind trace elements, and even small traces of evidence can provide big clues that help solve cases. One example is a case handled by the Department of Justice a few years ago. In the early morning hours of January 20th of 2010, three Caucasian men were loitering around a pickup truck in a parking lot at a gas station in Alpena, Arkansas. A short time later, five Hispanic men arrived in a green 1995 Buick with Sabre. After the men fueled their car and paid for gas, the Caucasian men began shouting racial epithets. The Hispanic men ignored the threats and drove away. But the Caucasian men entered a pickup truck and sped after the Buick. Several miles down the road, the truck caught up to the Buick and repeatedly rammed into it from behind. The driver of the Buick lost control and the car left the road and flipped over. It hit a tree and burst into flames. The victims were badly injured but fortunately survived. The suspect, uh, suspects abandoned their truck down the road. When law enforcement arrived, they noticed fresh damage and a green paint smear on the truck's front bumper. They identified the driver as Frankie Maybe, pardon me, the owner is Frankie Maybe, but when questioned by the police, he denied that his truck had been involved in the incident. The FBI crime lab then examined the paint smear taken from the front of the truck. The examiners compared information collected from that paint smear to a forensic database. They searched for automobile paint colors used at a GM plant where the Buick was made during the years that that model was produced. A database entry established that the Buick used a paint consistent with that paint smear. The examiners also determined that the chemical composition of the paint was consistent with the paint recovered from the truck. That forensic evidence helped to prove that contact had occurred between the truck and the car that carried the five victims. As a result, maybe and a passenger were the first defendants the Department of Justice ever charged under the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd hate crime statute of 2009. When confronted by the evidence, the passenger pleaded guilty. Maybe went to trial, and an FBI forensic examiner testified about the chemical and paint match. As a result, a federal jury convicted Maybe of six counts under that Shepard Bird Hate Crimes Prevention Act, and he was sentenced to 135 years in prison. That is just one example of the use of forensic science in the criminal justice system and its critical role in the search for truth. Forensic science is so important to our mission that the Attorney General has made it a priority for the department to make effective and reliable use of forensic science. We practice forensic science here in the department in our many laboratories. We fund forensic science through grants by the Office of Justice Programs, and our prosecutors are consumers of forensic science uh, in litigating cases in courts throughout the country. As I mentioned last summer, the Attorney General appointed Ted Hunt as a senior advisor on forensic science to conduct a review of the department's forensic practices and advise us on the best way forward to optimize our use of forensic science. He's been assisted by uh, federal prosecutors throughout the country as well as by our Office of Legal Policy and in coordination with many of you in state and local law enforcement. 
We're strengthening the reliability of forensic methods. We are enhancing our lab capabilities. And we are increasing collaboration on forensic uh, issues within the Department of Justice. We recognize that forensic evidence is most often used by you in state and local law enforcement. So our renewed focus includes the creation of two working groups uh, that include representatives thro from throughout the country. The first is the Council on Federal Forensic Laboratory Directors, which is the only federal interagency group solely devoted to forensic science. It includes officials from the department and other executive branch agencies with forensic labs and capabilities. The goal is to spot trends, share intelligence, identify research needs, and focus on collaborative ways to use forensic science in the fight against crime. The second group includes state and local crime lab directors and forensic science researchers. Their focus will be on the forensic technology needs of state and local law enforcement because one of the things that we hear throughout the country is about backlogs and the need for additional resources for our forensic labs. This group will advise the department about how we can best support forensic research and introduce new technologies into America's crime labs. In the near future, we expect to see the widespread use of rapid DNA testing in crime labs and police booking stations. The ATF and DEA, pardon me, ATF and FBI labs already use software that computes the probability that various combinations of individuals are donors to complex DNA mixtures. That technology is also being used, I know, in many state and local forensic labs. More advanced DNA technologies are being developed, and they will soon be ready to resolve some of our most challenging forensic samples. One example is next generation sequencing, which can distinguish the smallest components of mixed DNA molecules from multiple people. And having been in law enforcement for almost 30 years, uh, I can tell you that when I started, lawyers didn't have to know much about DNA and science. You all faced challenges that we didn't face 30 years ago, increasing uh, the need, really, for you to be properly trained and understand these concepts. Other technologies like 3D imaging and the high resolution optical analysis of tool marks, latent prints, and shoe mark features are now routine are now in advanced stages of research and development and will be routine in the future. Those tools will enhance the capability and reliability of forensic pattern matching in the near future. Of course, in order to fully use these technologies in American courtrooms, the evidence has to be admissible by our judges. And I know that many of you who work on the front lines have faced challenges in recent years, even to routine methods of analysis like fingerprinting that has been used for about 100 years. You now face Fry and Daubert challenges routinely uh, to all of your forensic science techniques. Many of the methods that they challenge involve the comparison of evidence patterns like fingerprints, shell casings, and shoe marks to known sources. Our critics argue that these methods have not undergone sufficient testing or the right amount of validation or they involve too much human interpretation and judgment to be accepted as scientific methods. But those arguments are based on the false premise that a scientific method needs to be instrument-based, automated, and quantitative, excluding human interpretation and judgment. Those critiques contributed to a recent proposal to revise Federal Rule of Evidence 702 for cases involving forensic evidence. That effort stems from an erroneous view overly narrow view of forensic science and its application in the courtroom. The federal rule of evidence, which is similar to many of the state rules, Federal Rule 702, uses the phrase scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge, which makes clear that it is designed to permit the introduction of testimony that calls on skills and judgment beyond the knowledge of a layperson, and not merely the work of scientists in laboratories. Forensic science is not only quantitative, or automated, it need not be free of human judgment. That's just not true of forensic science. It's also the case in other applied fields, such as medicine, computer science, and engineering. There is always room for judgment. The astronomer Carl Sagan said that science is a way of thinking more than it is a body of knowledge. His point illustrates that science is inescapably a human endeavor. Human observation, Comparison, interpretation, and judgment are core components of science. They're also key components of good expert testimony in a courtroom. The fact finder benefits from expert assistance to place forensic evidence in the proper context. The importance of that interpretive role is embodied in our federal rule of evidence. It conditions the admissibility of expert testimony on its ability to help the trier of fact understand the evidence or to determine a fact and issue. 
So interpretation and judgment are essential aspects of what forensic scientists do. And it's important that they properly explain and describe their test results and their testimonial conclusions. That's why we decided in the department to develop uniform language for testimony and reports. Our uniform language, we call them ULTRs, include approved terms, definitions, and bases for conclusions offered by our examiners. The goal is to avoid subsequent challenges that the examiners didn't use the right word or that they overstated their conclusion. So our goal is to have an agreed upon framework for the kind of language that we can use uh, and how we can explain the findings reached by our examiners. They also include guidance uh, about the statements that our examiners should avoid when giving testimony, such as overstating the level of certainty justified by the evidence. We recently approved eight new uniform language documents, and those are all posted on the Justice Department's internet, so they're available to you and available to the public. In addition to that, we instituted a program to monitor testimony by employees of our forensic labs and digital entities. It establishes a framework with concise guidance for evaluating the courtroom testimony of our forensic examiners. Our labs and our computer analysis centers have used that guidance to develop policies for evaluating the quality and content of testimony offered by the examiners. I spoke earlier this morning with Jen Smith, who's participating here today, a former FBI uh, examiner now working in D.C. And what, what happens with the FBI, we send our experts out to testify. Uh, we want to make sure that we get feedback, both to uh, improve the capabilities of the examiners and also to properly evaluate the testimony that they give to make sure that they're complying with the standards established by the department. These are two measures, the ULTRs and the testimony monitoring. These are two measures designed to maintain the consistency and quality of our lab reports and our testimonial presentations to ensure that they meet the highest standards of professionalism and ethics. As prosecutors, we do need to understand the basics of science, technology, and the methods that we use in court. A functional level of forensic literacy is now essential. But one key challenge we face as lawyers is that math and science are not necessarily our first language. Our stock and trade is words, not equations or formulas. Judge Hamilton of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit spoke about the interdisciplinary aspect or divide between science and the law and the need for lawyers to develop the expertise to bridge that gap. He wrote, law must apply itself to the life of a society driven more and more by technology and technological improvements. Judges and lawyers do not have the luxury of functional illiteracy in either of those two cultures. Sometimes effective presentation, cross-examination, and evaluation of expert testimony require lawyers and judges to fill in gaps in their scientific engineering or mathematics educations or to refresh their memories about them. As Judge Hamilton noted, the legal profession is an applied discipline we as prosecutors need to learn as much as we can about the types of evidence that we introduce in court. So as you hear about new scientific terms and learn about new forensic techniques, keep in mind that forensic science is a powerful tool that we must understand fully, use responsibly, and defend appropriately in order to satisfy our ultimate duties as prosecutors to uncover the truth and pursue justice. In closing, uh, Attorney General Robert Jackson, who I mentioned earlier, in 1940 gave a speech in this building about the role of the prosecutor, and he concluded his remarks by saying that the citizen's safety lies in the prosecutor who tempers zeal with human kindness, seeks truth and not victims, serves the law and not factional purposes, and approaches the task with humility. In summary, Jackson's timeless advice is to seek the truth, serve the law, and in the words of a country music song, always stay humble and kind. Those are important attributes of prosecutors. So I want to thank you for your service to our state, local, and federal prosecutorial offices. I'm grateful that you joined us this week, and I hope you find this to be a productive symposium. Thank you very much.